God just changed everything. Gave me a heart and a passion to reach them. And uh, that's what missions is all about. Missions is about people. Um, and, you know, as Pastor was talking about, America needs more missionaries, too. Uh, more church planners. Uh, it's, it's sad in my wife and I that, you know, we hear uh, the churches are closing. We hear that there are so many churches that don't have a pastor. That for so many years they're looking for a pastor. And, um, you know, it's sad. You know, God is still calling. I believe that God is still in the business of calling people into the ministry. And, uh, but people are rejecting God's voice. Uh, they're ignoring God. And uh, we got to pray for America. Uh, we don't want to become like England, right, who used to send out missionaries. And now missionaries are being sent out to uh, England. And uh, we don't want America to become that. And so we encourage you, as I mentioned, to stop by our table, take a prayer card. They're for free uh, and uh, we won't charge you a dime. Praise the Lord. Uh, but let's get into the word of God. That's what we came for. Amen. Let's go to the book of First Thessalonians, chapter one. First Thessalonians, chapter one. And uh, if. For whatever reason, out of nowhere, you hear me speak in another tongue. I'll do my best to interpret. Amen. Sometimes Spanish creeps in and it comes out. And uh, we don't have, I don't know if there's, a, well, we, I, had, I did hear someone speak Spanish uh, here when we were here yesterday. So maybe he'll be able to confirm, right, uh, the interpretation. Uh, two, there you go. Amen. There you go. One, we got one somewhere around there. You've been taking Spanish as well. So we're all set. Good to go. Amen. All right. First Thessalonians chapter number one. Uh, let's read from verses two. And on it says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you uh, in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received uh, the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. I want you to look again in verse number eight. What it says about the believers of Thessalonica, it says in the middle there, but also in some place. Is that what it says in your Bible? No. In every place, your faith to God. Where and notice the next phrase is spread abroad. Join with me tonight as I try to do my best to preach a message entitled, The Marks of a Contagious Church. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we can gather together on a Thursday night. Lord, we could be doing so many other things tonight. We could be resting. We could be finishing projects. We could be working. Uh, Lord, there's so many things that we could do. Uh, but Lord, what a blessing it is to be in your house with your people, with your word, and Lord, we ask you, we beg you, please, God, would you meet with us? Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and work in our hearts to perform surgery. Uh, we give you permission, oh God, to make the changes that are necessary. I pray, God, that if you need to uh, challenge someone in that one area, I pray you do so. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here discouraged, I pray you encourage them. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, we'll be different than the way we came, Lord. The yes. Lord, that we will just not be hearers of the word, but we'll be doers. That we will try to do our best, Lord, to take at least one principle from the word and try to apply it to our lives, Lord, as we go through the rest of this week. Lord, I thank you so much for the liberties that we have here in America. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have your perfect word in English, Lord, yes. that we can preach, that we can know your will for our lives. And Father, I pray that you just use it for your honor and your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. During the spring of 2020, all around the world, people everywhere 
went into a quarantine. I know a lot of us have PTSD from 2020 with coronavirus. We really don't want to relive those moments. But remember those days when they first announced that this virus from China began to spread and it was beginning to go to different countries. And in just a matter of a few months, it has spread around the world. Scientists really didn't have a clue what was going on. They maybe put on a front and said that, you know, that it means this and you have to do that. Uh, they were saying that this virus was spread by coughing, spread by sneezing, and that this virus will stay on the surface for many, many hours. And so scientists encouraged to uh, protect yourself, to wear gloves, to wear a mask. Uh, you know, we, I saw so many funny videos in the Dominican Republic while we were quarantined of people wearing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know? I'm thinking, what is this, World War III, you know? Like, what is going on? And uh, as I'm watching all these different videos and uh, I hear about America and how uh, y'all had issues here in the stores, you know? People were fighting one with another because y'all were running out of toilet paper. <laughs> how many of y'all remember those days, right? <laughs> you know, when I saw those videos, I thought to myself, Honey, we need to go to the store and make sure that we have plenty of toilet paper here in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> so we went to our small grocery store there in Nahua. We normally actually travel to the capital three hours uh, uh, every month at the beginning of the month to load up on meat and different foods for the whole month. And uh, it was the middle of, it was actually towards the end of March when the Dominican Republic shut down. And when I started seeing these videos, and so... We were not able to cash our check uh, in April or May, so we're scrambling, looking for food. We ate a lot of rice and beans and beans and rice. I mean, we were, we were not just, uh, you know, Dave Ish, you know, Dave Ramsey, y'all heard of him, right? Yeah, but anyways, we were not Dave Ish, you know, and it was not our choice. We just had to, beans and rice, rice and beans. But anyways, you know, we were looking and we went into the store and we were afraid that there was not going to be any toilet paper. And then we went and ran to that aisle after a long line waiting for two, three hours, go in there and wow, it was stocked up. <laughs> All kinds of toilet paper, cheap, regular, premium. I mean, I said, wow, you know, I could probably buy all of this toilet paper, send it to the U.S. and make some good money, you know? <laughs> and uh, obviously nothing was coming in or going out anyways, so... I guess we got all of the toilet paper that was left. Uh, but anyways, we were, you know, going in there. I'm glad we had toilet paper. And then, you know, my wife loves a few bag of chips. And then we get into the chips area, which is just a little corner stand, you know. And there were no bag of chips. You know, we said, what is going on here, you know? Uh, but what's more important, toilet paper or bag of chips, <laughs> right? And so, but listen, this virus uh, brought a lot of trouble, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety around the world, and everyone was afraid because this virus was spreading rapidly. Just like this virus spreads so fast. You know what God wants for the local church? God wants us to be a contagious church. God wants us to be gospel spreaders. God wants us to be love spreaders. God wants us to spread the gospel, not just here uh, in our area, in our local church, but around the world. The Bible says in verse number eight that this church was a contagious church. It was a church that carried the light, that carried the gospel. It says in the middle, it says, but also in every place your faith to God word, it says, is spread abroad. You know, most people that got the virus were called carriers. Why? Because they were carrying this virus. They had it on them. And they were supposed to quarantine. They were supposed to, uh, you know, social distance, stay away from society. And I'm so glad we're so far away from that. Amen. I'm glad, so glad that I can see people. I can, you know, shake hands. I can talk to people face to face. And we don't have to have that distance, that separation. Amen. We were meant to love one another. Amen. We were meant to spend time with one another. You know, I, I'm glad for technology. I'm glad we were able to have, you know, live streams even while that was going on. But it was uh, such a, a time of rejoicing when the church was able to gather together again uh, in person, in church, and be able to shake hands with your brother and your sister and say, I'm so glad to see you. 
There's nothing better than gathering together, as the Bible teaches that we're supposed to do. But this church, this body of believers, they were contagious. They, they had something that the rest of the world needed, that the rest of the world wanted, that the rest of the world, as they, from the outside, as they look into the Thessal- Thessalonians, they said, I don't know what it is about them, but I want what they have. There's a peace that they have that I want. There's a joy that they have that, that I need. That, that there's, there's just a love that they have that I've never experienced. What is it that you have, Thessalonians? And as th- this news spread abroad, it was contagious. Others believed. Others received the gospel. Look at verse number 7. It says, so that ye were in samples. They became an, insa- an insa- example to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. You know, there's other people that are watching us as a church, as an individual, and they're going to copy what we do. You know, whether you're an older brother or whether you're a parent or whether, you know, you're a pastor or a missionary, somebody's always looking up to you, whether you know it or not. Are you an example? This church was a godly church. This church was a godly example It was a contagious church. It says in every place, in every place, their faith to God were spread abroad. And that's what I want. I I want our church in in Nahua to learn that it's not just about reaching Nahua, but it's about reaching the whole Dominican Republic. And it's about reaching the whole Caribbean. And it's about reaching the rest of the world. Yeah, this is not, Jesus didn't just die for a specific country. He didn't just die for a specific group of people. He died for the whole world. He died for all men. Uh, you can't knock on the wrong door, amen. Uh, you can't preach to the wrong person. And I know that we joke as we go out door knocking, you know, if they have a dog that's barking, then, you know, he's not of the elect, amen. You know, you get all, you, you get all Calvinistic and everything, right? But listen, you can't knock on the wrong door. You can't preach to the wrong person because Jesus died for all of mankind. Bible says who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants us to take the gospel to the whole world. That's why you see all those missionaries back there. Because this church wants to take the gospel, not just here, but around the world. And I believe there are three things that the Apostle Paul mentions here about this church. Certain things that they had in their lives that I believe if we can apply it to our lives, we'll become a contagious believer. We'll become a contagious church. We'll become spreaders of love, of kindness of the fruit of the Spirit, of the love of God, if we put these things into practice. Number one, notice that this church had a work of faith. Verse number three, all these points, these three points are going to come out of this passage right here. Remember without ceasing your work of faith. Now we know that the Bible teaches us clearly that the salvation is not by works. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says that for by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any men should boast. So this church, when they started their journey, it all started by faith. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, here's the story of how these believers heard the gospel, how they got saved. And the same way that they got saved is the same way that you and I got saved. And is the same way that believers have gotten saved in the Old Testament and in this time is the same way, by faith. Look at it in verse uh, chapter 17. Let's begin reading in verse uh, number 2. It says in Paul, verse 1 talks about how he was there in Thessalonica and he went to the synagogues uh, to talk to the Jews, to preach to them. It says in Paul, verse 2, as his banner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath day reasoned with them out of what, church? The scriptures. It says, opening, alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. What was the message that the Apostle Paul was sharing with the, Th- with the Thessalonians? Hey, there's this Messiah that the scriptures, the Old Testament has been talking about for many, many years. 
And this Jesus, this man that you heard about, this man that healed people, this man that, was, that has supernatural power, this man that was crucified, this man that was buried and that rose again, he is the Christ. That was the message. The gospel. First Corinthians talks about what is the gospel. The gospel is good news. The good news that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he arose again is good news. Because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, then now we have access to God. Now we have salvation available to us because of Jesus. That's what he preached. He preached the gospel. Notice what it says in verse 4. This is an encouragement. And some of them believed. You know, when you preach the gospel, not everyone is going to get saved. Not everyone is going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times we, we, we get discouraged and we get down and, and we, we want to see numbers and we want to see results. Remember, your job is to be a witness. Your job is to be a warner. Your job is to just preach the word of God and let the Holy Spirit do the work. You know, you go into the jails and you preach the gospel. Now all those, all those inmates, they're not going to get saved. But I'm so glad that there's some that believe. You know, when we went to Nawa, we really don't really go out door knocking because the doors that they have uh, further up, there's this gate. You know, everything is just bars. You know, you feel like you're in jail. Uh, but it's for protection, you know. And it's interesting, the perspective. You know, we grew up there in the Dominican. It was normal for us to have bars in the windows and have bars in the front of the, the house and have bars uh, in the door, you know, in front of it. We're, no, it's normal for us. We're used to it. And, you know, missionaries come and, you know, they say, wow, I feel like I'm in jail. You know, I got bars here and bars over there. And to us, it's like, no, nah, I feel protected. You know, I feel good. You know, the thieves are not going to get in. And so two perspectives. Huh? It all depends how you see things. But uh, I don't know where I was going with that, you know. But anyways, oh, as we go out visiting and as we go out sowing, and, you know, we, we can't really knock on their door because it's so far away. But we holler. Hey, we're from North Coast Baptist Church. God bless you. And they come on out and start talking to you. People are open to the gospel. People will talk to you. Sometimes for 30 minutes, sometimes for two minutes, sometimes for two hours. And they'll give you coffee and, uh, and amen, you know. And so uh, it all depends. But, uh, you know, you, we went out there when we started and, you know, here we're getting ready for, I, I, you know, the first day of the church. We're thinking, man, it's on Easter Sunday, you know. We're going to have a big old crowd, you know. Who doesn't go to church on Easter Sunday? The things that you learn when you're a missionary, amen? And, you know, we prepared and we passed out so many flyers and we invited and we had a promotion. And, and I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks we prepared and then came that Sunday, April 1st. I think it was because we started on April 1st, April Fool's Day, you know, it was a bad day to start. But anyways, Resurrection Sunday, we were expecting a big crowd and we're expecting hopefully to see some souls saved. And only 14 people showed up. But I tell you what, we're so thankful for the 14 that came. We're so thankful. And the church has grown over the years. There were times as I was talking to someone when it was just my wife and I and maybe two teenagers on a Sunday night. But we had church. We sang hymns. And we preached the word of God. And the Holy Spirit worked in those young people's heart. And the Holy Spirit worked in my heart and my wife's heart. And we had church. Little by little, church started to grow. And now I'm so excited. Last Sunday, we received pictures of seeing uh, someone getting baptized and seeing new visitors. And church is still moving on. Uh, that is an encouragement to me. But it's not about us. It's not about numbers. It's about God. It's about His work. This church, it says, some believed. You know, God doesn't need a big old army, if I could call it that way, to impact this world. If He only needed just a few apostles to turn this whole, their world and their time upside down, and get the gospel throughout the whole world of that time there in Europe? Don't you think with so many 
great Bible preaching churches around America, that we can be a contagious church, that we can spread the gospel and take the word of God and take the gospel where in places that we have never heard, we should be able to. But we don't have this work of faith. We know that it all starts by faith. Salvation is by faith. Uh, The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse uh, number 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need preaching of the word of God. We need someone to present the gospel, someone to present my need that I am a sinner, that I am condemned, that I am on my way to hell and that I need a savior, that I need Jesus, that he was the ultimate prize and that I need to repent and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be able to be a son of God. Someone needs to share that message with you. Remember that person that preached the gospel to you? Remember that message that you heard? Remember that time when you got saved? I remember when I got saved. Actually, it's a funny story. I was eating a McChicken when I got saved. <laughs> right after a baseball practice, a Puerto Rican uh, player was sharing the gospel. He was on fire for God. And he bought me a McChicken there. I'm in the back of his car and we're eating and we're talking. I don't know where he turns around. I just met him for the first day. And he says, hey, Jeff, if you were to die today, you think you'd go to heaven? And the first thing that came to my mind was, this guy's going to kill me today in the back of this car. <laughs> I have never met this man. And he's asking me where I'm going when I die. <laughs> Afterwards, he realized that I was a little shaken up, scared. No, 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 don't worry, man. I'm not doing anything to you. And I'm a Christian, and I just, I just want to see what you believe. I was like, oh, I'll be able to watch cartoons tonight. Amen? <laughs> but he shared the gospel. I got saved. I got saved that day. I remember it like it was yesterday. But someone shared the gospel, and I placed my faith on this book. I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus changed my life. I was on, on a road to, to do things that was not going to please the Lord. I'm so glad he saved me when I was 13 years old. He spared my life from so much hurt and from so much pain. And by the way, young people, listen, I know the grass may look greener on the other side, but when you get there, it's not as green as it looks, okay? Uh, listen, you're, you're saving yourself so much headache. You're saving yourself so much problems. Stay in with God. There's nothing good in this world for you. There's nothing better than being in the center of God's will. This church started because they put their faith in Jesus. They believed. They trusted God. And the Bible is very clear that salvation is by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 5 tells us not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us. And there's so many more verses that talks about how we're saying that that the faith is the avenue by which we receive the grace of God. That is nothing that we do, that it is all that God has done through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Work of faith. What is that talking about? It's saying that their faith produced works. You know, when you get saved, you get saved by faith. How many of you have ever seen Jesus? How many of you have ever seen Jesus? None of you, right? How many of you ever saw him resurrect from the dead? None of you is by faith. And just like by faith you accept this book, you place your trust in the word of God and you believe that you will be in heaven because he said so. Now you live and you walk by faith. Several times the scripture says the just shall live by faith. Hebrews chapter 11. Why is it there? To remind us that without faith it is impossible to please him. True work always originates in faith. And this church here, the Thessalonians, the Thessalonica church, had a faith that was active, that produced works. Verse number nine, it illustrates what happened after they got saved. This faith that they placed in Jesus performed a transformation in their lives. You know, if someone accepts the Lord Jesus Christ and they, 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 they talk the same way and they walk the same way and there's no change in their lives, I don't think they got saved. This church here, when they got saved, they got saved by faith just like every other believer. And just like the word of God says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at verse number 9. If you're in 1 Thessalonians, or if not, let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9. Here's their testimony. Here's the Apostle Paul talking about this church. It says, for they themselves, verse number 9, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Amen. When did that happen? That happened first when the apostle Paul went and preached the gospel and some believed. They put their faith and trust in Christ and after they got saved because they put their faith in Christ, then now Jesus Christ is performing surgery. Now he's beginning to uh, work on their lives. Now this is what we call sanctification. Now they're being modified. They're being changed. They're being transformed now to the image of Christ. And they allowed God to do that. They used to serve idols. And they realized that the Old Testament did not allow that. God's law did not allow that. And they said, you know what? I want to please God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God enough that I'm going to get rid of these idols and I'm going to serve only the true living God. Amen. This church was able to spread the gospel. Why? Because they had a work of faith. It doesn't mean that they got saved by works or that they worked themselves to go to heaven. It's just saying that they got saved by faith and because they got saved by faith, their faith produced works. Amen. Their faith uh, produced uh, or activated works that they could not perform on their own. This is something that only God can do. Listen, I didn't used to go, want to go to church. I didn't want to read my Bible. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to do the things of God. But when, when the Holy Spirit came inside of me, when I accepted Jesus Christ, I now want to read my Bible. I now want to go to church. Now I'm hungry for the things of God. Listen, that, only God can do that. It's a work of God. Now God wants us to live by faith. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk or behave or conduct ourselves in them. Faith rests upon the work of God, not our work. When we rest on God's work, then God produces his work through us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be back in 1 Thessalonians. Is it okay if we use the Bible, church? Amen. All right. Just want to make sure. And if you said no, we'll still use the Bible. Amen. <laughs> all right. Hebrews chapter number 11. We all know this portion of Scripture, the Hall of Faith, as many call it. These are all the men and women in the Bible that had faith in God. And I want you to notice that all these people that had faith in God, they did something. You know, I see back there the definition of faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it's here in verse number one. My youth pastor, I remember when I was going to church, he defined faith as believing God so much that you're willing to do something about it. I said, man, I love that definition. Just keeping it simple. Amen. And that's what we see in Hebrews 11. We see people that trusted God's word so much that they were willing to do whatever God said. I want you to notice that all these people that are going to be listed, at least the ones that we will see here uh, quickly, they did something for God. They didn't do these things to gain God's favor. They didn't do these things to go to heaven. They already trusted God. They were doing it because God has said so. And they say, well, if God said it, I believe it, I'm going to do it. Amen. Look what it says. Look what it says about Noah. Verse 7. It says, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. And what does it say, the next word? Prepared an ark. So he had to do some. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into the place which he uh, should after receive an inheritance, what did he do? He obeyed. He packed up his bags and he left. Right. Had no clue where he was going. But he was trusting God. Why? Faith, you believe God so much that you're willing to do something about it. And it goes on of 
Many other people here in the word of God it talks about Sarah, it talks about Isaac and Jacob. But look at verse number 23 about Moses and even the faith of Moses' parents. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, what did his parents do? Was hid three months of his parents. These parents believed that if, if they would hide Moses, that God would spare his life. They had faith in God. Look what it says about Moses in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with uh, the people of God, rather, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a se season. All of them. Look at verse 27. What did he do? By faith, he forsook Egypt. When you trust God, you're going to do something about it. If you trust God, if you put your faith in him so much, you're going to say, you know what? God, if that's what you want, what you want me to do, I'll do it. I'll obey. I'll go. I'll do. I'll give. Why? Because you're trusting God. Because faith produces works. Someone that professes to be a believer and there is no evidence of a believer. There's no evidence of love for one another. There's no evidence of any desire for learning the scripture or any desire to share the gospel with others. I myself, as a human being, I'm not God. I don't know who's saved, who's not saved. I can't see your heart. But as a human being, all I can see is your works, the way you react. I can only see that. And I begin to doubt whether you're saved or not. And I'm not here to try to doubt your salvation. All I'm saying is when someone is saved, when someone places their faith and trust in God, they're changed forever. They're changed forever. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The Apostle Paul said, And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. What is he saying? Listen, that he worked and he worked for the Lord, but God was the one that was giving him the strength. It was God that was working through him to be able to do what he had called him to do. So what did this church have? Number one, this church had a work of faith. And number two, let's go back. Let's go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This church had a labor of love. Labor of love. It says in verse number 3, Remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. It's interesting, we were just talking about this uh, right before the church service, the difference between labor and between work and labor. Work has to do with God working through us, and labor is what we do. Uh, put it into work to keep your family here, to, to serve God, and uh, it's here in the passage. Amen? Amen? But listen, the word labor here has the idea of working until you're exhausted. Biblical love is more than sentimental. Love is not just sweetness. We confuse cultural love with true biblical love. Agape love is the willingness to sacrifice for others. It is others-oriented. To love sacrificially is to labor until it hurts. So this church, they had a labor of love. In other words, they were working for God, and while they were doing it, they were doing it in love. They were doing it in the love of God. They were doing it in this agape love, this sacrificial love, this love that's not uh, thinking about me. What can I get out of church? But instead was thinking of what can I give to the church? How can I serve? How can I serve God? How can I be used of God to love others? This church had a labor of love. And I'm so glad that that same love is the love that we receive from heaven. I'm so glad that the Bible tells us, but God. Don't you like those passages in the scripture where it says, but God? But God commendeth his love, showed, proved, demonstrated his love toward us. In the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We deserve help, but yet God loved us. God demonstrated that love. 1 John 4, 8, if you want to know what love is, here it is. He that loveth not, nor if not God, for God is love. There, is, there it is. God is equal to love. You want to know what love is? Get to know God. And you'll find out exactly what love is. You know, love is the greatest motivator there is. Tomorrow morning, it's going to be cold. Many of you are going to wake up early in the morning to go to work. 
You're not going to go to work because you love to work. Nobody likes to work. You know, if you had to choose whether working or sleeping, you'll probably choose sleeping. Amen. All right. But you do it because you got to provide for your family. You got to pay the bills and you have uh, goals that you want to meet and uh, you have a faith promise that you want to uh, fulfill. Right. And, and you have all these different things in your mind that you're considering that you got to do. Love is a great motivator. You know, there in the Dominican Republic, as I mentioned, baseball is huge, huge. You know, from the time that uh, a wife is pregnant, uh, the husband is, you know, crossing his fingers, crossing his toes, lighting up candles and doing all kinds of stuff. Let it be a boy. Let it be a boy. Let it be a boy. So he can be a baseball player. And uh, then he can go to America, make some money, make some millions of dollars, hook us up. You know, that's what they're thinking about. Baseball is huge. And I, I, we've seen it. You know, when we got there, we wanted to start a baseball ministry to be able to reach out to the teenagers and through that, uh, win for the cause of Christ. And, uh, but we weren't able to. All of them, from the time 6 in the morning all the way to 6 p.m., after they're, you know, 8, 10 years old, they're going to all these, they have this schedule of going to the gym and then going to baseball practice to get ground balls and hitting and then going back to the gym in the afternoon. And, I mean, it's a baseball factory, literally. And they work and they work and they work. And those kids, they love it. You know why? Because they, add, they have their eyes said, I'm going to America. I'm going to make millions. And it, it doesn't hurt. They have a passion for baseball. You know, I think about Jacob. You know, the many years that he had to wait, he had to work in order to get the woman, the girl that he liked, worked seven years. Can you imagine that, guys? You know, a pretty girl, and you say, you know what, I want to marry this girl. And, you know, that preacher, you know, that's his dad, and it's difficult to get the girl, you know. And you say, preacher, I think I'm going to marry your daughter. And he says, well, you got to work for me for seven years. You said, all right, I work. Then seven years passes by, and preacher says, hey, by the way, you got to work seven more years. <laughs> you know, and he still works seven more years. And then he doesn't get the girl. You know, he gets a different one. But uh, Genesis 29, 20 tells us, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had to her. I love that. Wow. What love can do. Make it seem like it was just a day when it was seven years. It didn't hurt him working for her because he loved her. Does it hurt you to work for God? Are you willing to serve God? Are you willing to vacuum the church? Are you willing to pass out tracts? Are you willing to clean the toilets? Nobody want to clean the toilets. Are you willing to do what it takes to serve God? My parents, can I challenge you? Would you be willing to allow your son, your daughter, to go into the mission field? It's a scary thought. Are you willing to serve God? You know, there's a guy in Nagua that uh, this journalist, as he was going around, it was in the afternoon, he was tired, and he was thirsty. This man had this cooler, like the ones they, they sell in Walmart. They're kind of plasticky. You can break them easily. I guess they're made out of foam. But he had one of those. It was about this big, and he put tape on it so it would stay sealed. And in the morning, he'll load it up with uh, bottles of water and ice on him to keep him cold. And he uh, applies some straps on him so he can carry it around. And uh, he would go around all over Nawa selling water, 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 water from morning till sundown. And this uh, journalist saw him and he was tired, bought a water from him, started to talk to him and uh, get to know him. And out of nowhere, out of the corner of his eyes, he saw that at, in the corner there by the water cooler, there was a pacifier that was hanging there so the uh, this this uh journalist asked him and said hey i guess are you selling pacifiers as well jokingly he said he said no actually i have that pacifier there because there's certain times during the day where i'm tired i don't want to work anymore my back hurts i, I want to give up and uh whenever i feel like giving up whenever i feel like uh, not selling anymore, going home to rest a little bit. I look at that pacifier, and I am reminded of my little daughter that was born last week and how much my, my wife needs me to work, 
how much my baby daughter needs me to push through the pain so I can provide for them. Look, love is a great motivator. And this church, I believe, when they got saved, they experienced the love of Christ so much that it caused them to change their lives. They loved so much God, they said, the idols, I'm leaving that. Jesus died for me and showed his love for me. The least I can do is get away from these idols. But not just that, that love that they experienced from God, that Jesus died for them. They said, you know what, if God loved me, then I need to love others as well. And that's the kind of love that they had, a labor of love. They work hard at loving people. And because others in the region were seeing these people that used to be pagan, they used to serve false idol. Now they're serving God and they're serving and loving people. You know, when you have a relationship with God, when your relationship with God is straight, your relationship with man will be just fine. But that's where it starts. If you don't spend time with the Lord in the mornings or in the evening, whenever you do your devotionals in the word of God, things are not going to be okay during the afternoon, during the day with your spouse, with your friends, with your co-worker, with your neighbors. It starts with your, relation, with your, your relationship with God. What are the two greatest commandments that Jesus, as he was answering uh, those Pharisees and Sadducees that were trying to basically put him against the corner? Jesus says, love the Lord that God with all the heart, soul, and strength, and, and all your your might with everything. Love God, the first and most. Your relationship with God. The second is just, just like the first one. Love your neighbor as thyself. And then basically he was just saying there the Ten Commandments. First couple talks about your relationship with God. The rest talk about your relationship with people. Love God and love others. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14... For the love of Christ constraineth us. Wow. Wow. You know, God wants us to love one another. You know, I think about when people look at us, when others look at us, if they don't see love between us, they're going to they're gonna say, it's just like my house. It's just like my neighborhood. There's division here. There's strife. There's... Uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Why would I want what they have? And that's why Jesus said in the book of John that by this shall uh, all men know that you are my disciples if ye have love one to another. When you de demonstrate your love for someone else, and I'm saying sacrificial love, it is easy to love the lovable, right? It is easy to love those people that are kind and sweet and bubbly, right? But those people that are not... They're still our brother and our sister in Christ. That's right. And God wants us to love them. But you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand, Brother Jeffrey, that uh, they did this to me or they did that. Well, what do you do to Jesus? And he still loved you. If he was willing to love you and if he was willing to die for your sins, don't you think you can forgive your brother and your sister in Christ? In Revelation chapter 3, I see begins to talk, talk to all these different churches. The church at Ephesus had a good testimony. They had work, uh, they had labor, they had perseverance, but they still received a rebuke from the Lord. It says in Revelation 2, 2 through 5, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are, dev which are evil and thou hast tried them which say thou are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake thou hast labor and thou hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know, love is a recipe that we must have. It is an evidence of a believer. And we must have the labor of love. Lastly, number three, and we'll be finished. Patience of hope. Verse 3 tells us, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Hope has to do with the future. The Thessalonians' endurance came from their confidence in God's provision for eternity. They had their hope in Christ and hope that if they die, they were going to be in heaven. But I personally believe that they were not just looking at their salvation or their future in heaven, but they were looking at Jesus coming back 
for them. They had their hope in Jesus Christ. Hope in the Bible is not optimism, it's not just wishful thinking. The idea of hope in the Bible is confidence, assurance, certainty. Titus 2.13 tells us, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This word patience here has the idea of someone that continues under pressure. This church was going through much affliction. They were being persecuted. And yet, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of affliction, they had patience of hope. They were steadfast. They were unmovable. They served God, yet in spite of their circumstances. You know, there's a lot of Christians that, well, you know, I remember in youth conferences, you know, all the teenagers in the van, everything is great. You know, you got a great speaker that gets you pumped up, you know, and that whole week you're spiritual. I mean, you, are, you feel like you're in heaven, you know, and then you go back home, right? And you no longer have that preacher. You no longer have your, your godly friends. And you no longer have that devotional time. You no longer have all these different things. And now you're back in reality. But you know what? Uh, uh, this church here had a patience of hope. They were steadfast no matter what. They kept on serving God. When things got under pressure, when things got hard, they were faithful to God. There's so many churches that have changed. So many churches that have changed their Bibles. So many churches that have changed the, 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 their music, that have changed all kinds of different things. But you know what? I'm so glad for a church that has not changed. Amen. Last time we were here six years ago, the church has not changed. Still the same. Praise God for that. Amen. We want to be a contagious church. We want to spread the gospel. We must have work of faith. We must have labor of love. But we also must be patient in our hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We must and fast. And unmovable, uh, uh, abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be a gospel spreader. Just like Coca-Cola got contagious, if I could call it. Everyone loved Coca-Cola. As they tasted it, you know, you've seen all the commercials, the bubbles going, you know, and... Everybody drinks it, promoting it all over the world. Coca-Cola is everywhere right now. The gospel also needs to be around the world. We got something better than Coca-Cola or Mountain Dew, you know. I know you love Mountain Dew back there. We got something better. We got the good news of Jesus. And this church, this church has something special. God was working in their lives. God changed them so much that everyone else, when they heard about the Thessalonians, as they read about them, as they heard about it, they said, I don't know what it is, what they have, but I want that. Come on. Can the people around here in Shingle House, can the people in this region look at your local church and say, wow, I don't know what it is about those young people. I don't know what it is about those couples or those families, but I need what they have. Yeah, come on. It's not us. It's Jesus Christ. Right. Work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we can gather together around your word. I pray, Lord, that you help us. Oh, Lord, help us to be like these Thessalonians. Help us, oh, Lord. Many of us, I mean, it's a midweek service. Most of us are saved, have been redeemed. And thank you for that, oh, Lord. I pray, Lord, you help us to live by faith. To walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to obey when we hear your voice. And I, Lord, I pray that you examine our hearts. I pray you help us, Lord. Help our relationship with you to be where it should be. If you love me, keep my commandments. Help us to love you, O oh Lord. And Lord, as we love you and as we experience your love on a daily basis... Help us to be a channel that we will spread your love among others. First, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also with the rest of the world. That the world may know of the love of Christ. Others may know that Jesus saves. And Lord, as we give, as we pray, as we go or send missionaries around the world, 
I pray you help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I pray you help us to stay focused, Lord, on eternity. I pray you help us, Lord, to be patient in this hope. I pray you help us to stay, help us to keep us, Lord, steadfast. Help us to stay constant. It is so easy, so easy to change, so easy, Lord, to get lazy, so easy, Lord, to uh, be, get complacent. But Lord, help us to continue to work. The night cometh when no man can work. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Amen.